scripture reading this morning comes from John 3, verses 1 through 21. Hear these words. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to light, so that their deeds may not be exposed." But those who do what is true come to the light so that, it may be, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let me pray. God, I pray right now that I might just be a megaphone of your grace. Not say anything original or new, but just amplifying the voice of your love. In your name we pray. Amen. So Megan and I just got back from a week of vacation in California. Um, and before you start picturing us like hanging out on the beach with the ocean, that was not the type of vacation we experienced this past week. We, we flew to California with all three of our kids, which if you've flown with a 6, 3, and 1-year-old, you know that that is an adventure in and of itself. And, and then we got there and drove three hours up to my parents' house. The nearest big airport is three hours away. And then after being at my parents' house for a couple days, we drove seven hours down to Megan's parents' house. Again, all with a 6-year-old, 3-year-old, and 1-year-old. And granted, it was actually, I think, a lot more relaxing than we thought it was going to be. The kids were well behaved, way better behaved than we thought. We thought this was quite potentially going to be a miserable trip. <laughs> but it actually, it was a, a great trip. But I have this temptation when I'm on a vacation, particularly with three kids, to always have my cell phone out taking pictures, right? Or videoing every single thing that we do. Have you been there where you're, you're experiencing something in life that's just, it's so good and, and so neat. You just, you want to preserve it for the future. And so you, you just start videoing or, or taking pictures over and over. And I could have probably taken about a billion pictures on the course of this vacation. But I had to practice self-discipline and, and put down my cell phone so that I could be present in the moment. Yeah, there's this newer phenomenon with cell phones where we're so glued to what's happening on this four-inch screen and we're so worried about preserving it for the future that we miss out on 
the incredible moment that is present right before us. And so you've probably been there with, say, it's like an awesome meteor shower or something. And you're, you're here trying to, like, pick the right filter. And, oh, should I do this in slow-mo? Or should I, uh, what should I do here? And by the time you've figured out the right filter or lens to use, then you've missed the moment itself. And I think sometimes we do that with our faith as well. I want to talk about two different problems that sometimes we struggle with in our, in our walks of faith or our Christianity. And one of them is being too focused on the future. And the second one is viewing the world through the wrong lens. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus walks up to Jesus. It says Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. These were like the all-star Jewish people of the day. And he goes to Jesus and he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who came from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus tells him, look, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born from above. Or, or the translation could also say born again. To which Nicodemus stops and says, well, how is somebody supposed to be born again? What, what does that even mean? How is somebody supposed to experience a, a second birth? Now, we can infer from Jesus' response to Nicodemus that there must have been something about the way that Nicodemus approached Jesus and said that. Kind of like Nicodemus walked up to Jesus and was like, hey, Jesus, I, I know who you are. But we're cool, right? Like, we're kind of the same. Because Jesus then goes into this language about, wait a second. No, 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 no. Unless you are born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. You see, Nicodemus, as an all-star Jew, as a Pharisee, as a leader of the Jews, found his credentials in his physical lineage, in his birth. As a descendant of Abraham, like all of the Jewish people, their credentials were in their first birth. And Jesus looks at Nicodemus and says, no, 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 you've got this wrong. Your credentials are not in your first birth but in your spiritual birth. Your credentials are not earthly, but they're heavenly. It goes on later in the verse, in the passage, it says that Jesus told Nicodemus, if I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? In other words, Jesus looks at Nicodemus and says, look, you're looking at this whole thing all wrong. In fact, it's almost as if you're viewing the world through the wrong lens. So we've been going through this sermon series called Turning Points. And Mark, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Oh, man. Story after story. Last week we heard Chelsea's story. The week before we heard Shauna's story. These stories of the power of God to transform us from one direction in life to the next. And here's Nicodemus. Speaking with Jesus, and it's like Jesus is trying to say, Nicodemus, you're pointed in the wrong direction. I like to say sometimes that when we turn from one direction to the next, another metaphor that we could use is, through, is that of looking through a particular lens. It's as if Jesus was saying, look, okay, you've been viewing the world through this lens, but you're not seeing it quite right, so, so try these lenses instead. Like when you're at a movie. Have you been to a 3D movie recently? If you haven't been to a 3D movie in the past, say, 10 years, technology has changed quite a bit from what it had previously been. And you can sit there and you can see the screen and take off your glasses and everything's a little bit distorted and a, and a little blurry. You can, you can make out the images, you know what you're looking at, but it, it almost hurts to try to make sense of it. But then when you put on those glasses, not only does everything come into focus, but it becomes more real than you could ever imagine the same thing with our faith. Jesus looks at Nicodemus and says, you're looking at this world through an earthly lens. Instead, you need to be viewing the world through a heavenly lens. Here, try on these glasses instead. And then Nicodemus has the opportunity to try on the glasses that Jesus gives him and view everything brand new. Because the truth is, when we stop looking at this world through our own perspective, and instead we say, okay, God, I want to see the world like you see the world, all of a sudden, for the first time, everything begins to make sense. Everything has new purpose, has new meaning, because it's no longer through our earthly lens, but it's because it's through a, a heavenly 
lens. Now, that's not to say that everything is going to be right in the world. We'll talk about that more in just a second. But it does mean that sometimes, I should say all the time, God's view of what happens around us is so much bigger than we could ever see through our own lenses. A few years ago, Megan and I took Emily, who's now six, to the beach for the first time. She was about, I think, a year and a half. So just old enough to walk, but not old enough to like go swimming in the ocean. I remember we got everything set up. Again, speaking about the ordeals of road trips with kids, if you've been to the beach with a baby, you know that it's not exactly a vacation. You try to buy as much sunscreen as money will buy, and then you get the towels and the umbrella and the hats, and you get everything set up, and then you, you put on even more sunscreen. And I, I remember being there and being excited. Okay, she's going to try out the sand for the first time. We took off her sandals, and I started to lower her down onto the sand. And the lower I brought her, the higher her feet would get, kind of like this opposite. It's like someone was saying, the floor is lava, and she did not want to touch the sand. So finally we got her to just be comfortable in the sand. But she didn't want anything to do with the waves in the ocean. So I said, well, if she doesn't want to go down to the ocean, then maybe I'll bring the ocean to her. So we got one of those sandcastle buckets, and I brought the sandcastle bucket down to the waves, and I scooped up some water, and I brought it back up about 100 feet to the umbrella and to our little camp there. And I set it down and tried to show her how to play with the water. and She loved that. In fact, she loved it so much, she stood in the bucket. And she found herself just standing in the bucket with this big smile on her face. And for the rest of the afternoon, she played in that bucket. And it occurred to me in that moment that there was this innocent little baby playing in a bucket of water totally as happy as can be, not realizing that the source of that water and the enormity of the ocean was just 100 feet away from her. You see, sometimes as Christians, we find ourselves in these little buckets, and we call these buckets God. And we're comfortable in our bucket because it's small and warm and safe. But the bucket isn't God. The ocean is. The bucket isn't God. The ocean is way bigger than we could ever picture or imagine. And until we recognize the limits of our own definitions of who God is and how God operates in the world, then we will never be able to take off our earthly lenses and instead view all of, all of reality through the lens of God. Nicodemus was comfortable in his sandcastle bucket. Small and warm and earthly. And Jesus says, you are missing out on so much. You will never truly be able to see the kingdom of God unless you are born from above. Unless you put on this new world view that allows you to see the world on a much, much bigger level. So the first problem we have as Christians is that far too often we give in to this temptation to look at the world through the wrong lens. To interpret the things around us through the lens that we are comfortable. To interpret things through an earthly lens and not through the eyes of God. Now, the second thing we struggle with is sometimes we're way too focused on the future. One of the most famous verses in all of scripture, for, uh, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Now, there's a problem with this verse. I shouldn't say there's a problem with this verse. There's a problem with the way that we often interpret this verse. And that comes down to this phrase, eternal life. And so we tell ourselves, okay, what this verse is actually saying is that if I can just say a little prayer, and somewhere in the midst of that prayer I say, I believe in Jesus, then I know that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with God. And yes, that's part of it, but that's the bucket. 
If we open our eyes to what this verse is actually saying and about what Jesus is actually talking about in the entirety of his gospel message, we recognize that too often we sit in this little bucket looking forward to heaven in the future and we miss out on the enormity of God's mission to experience heaven here in the present. You see, in Jewish culture, they basically broke history into two different ages. There was the present age and there was the age to come. Scholars tell us that when we read this term, uh, eternal life, it is in reference to the age to come being currently present. That this idea of eternal life is not interpreted through a 21st century lens that says, I'm going to live forever in some far off heaven. It's talking about that far off heaven coming to us and the possibility of experiencing heaven happening right now. Now, I might be overusing metaphors this morning, but I've got another metaphor that really helps me understand what's happening here when we talk about the possibility of heaven being experienced here and today, and that is the metaphor of chocolate chip cookies. So I want you to picture in your head, if you will, the best chocolate chip cookies you have ever tasted. I mean, just fresh out of the oven. Can you smell them? Can you taste the gooey meltiness of those chocolate chips? These cookies are heaven. And these cookies are still in the oven. Now, the reality is we will not be able to taste those cookies that are cooking in the oven until Jesus returns. The cookies in the oven are heaven. We won't get to taste those cookies until Jesus returns. But... We've got the spoon with the cookie dough. (laughs) And in this life, we have the opportunity to taste the dough. The cool part about that is that as we taste the dough, we can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that those cookies are worth the wait because we've tasted the dough and the dough is good. So you can imagine how incredible the cookies will be in the end. The truth is, when we talk about eternal life, when we talk about turning points, when we talk about the opportunities we have to take off our earthly lenses and put on heavenly lenses, what we're talking about is a present reality. The opportunity that each of us have to experience heaven now. To experience the life transforming power of a God who created you and loves you and wants the best for you. If we would just open our eyes, we would see the goodness of God all around us. Now, I also need to just stop right here and take a little aside and say how ridiculous it must sound to be talking about cookies in light of tragedy in our world. And I thought about this all morning. Do I change up my sermon? Do I go in a completely different direction? How do we talk about the reality of evil in this world? And I decided to stick with the metaphor because as silly as it sounds, The metaphor of cookies and cookie dough still paints the picture of a gospel that is not just set on the future, but a gospel that can make a difference here today. You see, when we talk about the gospel, we're not talking about this type of Christian escapism that says, I'm going to say a prayer and I'm just going to wait my turn to get on that glory train and escape this world. We believe in a gospel that is so much bigger than that. A gospel that calls us to not only taste the cookie dough, but to become the cookie dough in this world. So that when we see evil, that when we see injustice, that when we see racism and hatred and everything else that is wrong with this world, we can answer God's call to step up and fight those things with good. Because heaven is not just a future reality. It's a reality that has broken into our present and God calls us to play a part.
This is a blessing and a responsibility. When we are handed that new set of lenses and we see the world as God sees the world, not only do we see the good in the world, but we're also made aware of the evil. God calls us to be the cookie dough. God calls us to look at the things in life and say, is that like heaven? If the answer is no, then we need to say, how can I work with God to fix it? Across the board, global situations, terrorist situations, injustices in our own neighborhood, problems in your family or with your coworkers, constantly ask yourself, is that like heaven? And if it's not, then there's something we can do about it. Then there's something we can do to combat evil with good and with love. We are called to be heaven here and now. When Jesus looks at Nicodemus, he says, look, you're getting this all wrong. You are limiting yourself to this tiny little bucket of comfort, this earthly lineage. What I give to you is so much bigger. Open your eyes with this brand new heavenly lens and your life will be changed. Your life will be different. You will get to experience eternal life, the age to come, God's perfect future here and today. So, we need to be constantly asking ourselves, am I wearing the right set of lenses? Have I actually trusted God to give myself over to God's leadership, to God's guidance, to put on God's set of lenses so that I can view the world as God views the world? And then the second question is, am I too focused on the future? Am I so focused on the future in this faraway heaven that I've totally given up on the possibility of working with God to redeem today, here, and now. It's my prayer that we would be a church that takes this calling seriously, that doesn't practice escapism Christianity, but instead says, how can we be present? How can we make a real difference? How can we be the cookie dough so that others might know that yes, someday we will all be eating the best chocolate chip cookies we've ever tasted. Amen? Amen.